And in the Roman meaning of Marcus, we have the harvest. Marcus means harvest. He read. And when you go to the Latino people, they also see it as a warlike person. One day, two minutes. Marcus means the harvest. Marcus also means warlike person. Mosiah is from the Hebrew. Hebrew. And it, it comes from the Hebrew word Mosiah. Which simply means the Savior or the Messiah. I'm breaking down the name so you will know who we are talking about. So Marcus, Mosiah, and Gavin is Irish. The name Gavin is Irish. And it means what? It means somebody who has a rough, peaceful time. Look at that conundrum. Rough, peaceful time. How can peace be rough? Now, later in the lecture, we will look at all these names, how these names impacted on this man. He was born in 1887, and he was born in St. Anne Bay, the capital of the parish of St. Anne, Jamaica. His father was a free slave. His grandparents were slaves taken all the way from Africa, but he had a drop of Irish blood in him. That meant that name Garvey. So they did not give him the name Garvey for nothing. Marcus Garvey himself had Irish blood in him. Ladies and gentlemen, his father himself was a very wonderful person. He knew how to work with a stone. He knew how to be a carpenter. So in Jamaica at that time, he was somebody people respected because he earned quite some cash. Now, Marcus Mosiah Gavi was born very dark. And in the words of people, some an Africanists who later called him round and ugly. Most Jamaicans saw him as an ugly person. Most Jamaicans saw Marcus Gavi as somebody who was downtrodden because he was very, very dark. Ladies and gentlemen, born in 1887, Marcus Gavi decided to follow his father. Gradually, gradually, gradually. His own father had about 10 children from two different wives. Marcus himself grew up as an adult who was very focused on achieving something in life. Marcus Gavin decided at a very young age, ladies and gentlemen, to go to school and study very hard. He had the opportunity to go to school, and he wanted to distinguish himself from the rest of the people who called him ugly and downtrodden. So you know what he did? He decided to study English very well. He decided to move himself away, ladies and gentlemen, from the rest of the Jamaican community that saw him as ugly and that saw him as downtrodden because he could speak very good English, what is called standard English. The people started to look down on him even more. He decided to get closer to the white people because he spoke very good English and he appealed more to the white man. So the white man, ladies and gentlemen, got to love Marcus Garvey. His own people saw him as ugly they saw him as somebody who was downtrodden because he was very dark. So he said, I'm not going to get my people's support. Why don't I rather appeal to the white man? Ladies and gentlemen, that was how Marcus Garvey was able to make it into the white man's world. He had a reason. When he got there, so much injustice around for black people. What did he decide to do? Like every other human being in Jamaica at that time wanted to travel. He traveled around Costa Rica and all those wonderful places. And then he arrived in England. When he arrived there in 1911, Kwame Nkrumah was only two years at that time. 1911. Then, all he was thinking about, ladies and gentlemen, was to make some money. I want to make money. 
I want to achieve it in life. When I am able to achieve it, then I will have a lot of respect. So he went out there to England looking for the so-called green pastures. There he met a gentleman called Dusi Muhammad Ali. Dusi Muhammad Ali. He was half Tunisian and half, half Egyptian. His father was very, very rich. Dusi Muhammad Ali, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very rich. His father was extremely rich. He went to school in England, that gentleman there. So he knew the ins and outs of England. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Garvey met this man in 1911. And this African employed Marcus Garvey as his messenger. Sent him in around, they had a newspaper called the African Orient Times. And Marcus Garvey was carrying the newspapers around, circulating them around, and showing people the power of the black man. So Marcus Garvey learned a lot of Pan-Africanism from Dusi Muhammad Ali. But Dusi Muhammad Ali was only interested in that wing of Pan-Africanism called Ethiop Ethiopianism. And Ethiopianism is, is, is simply talking about Ethiopia and you know so on and so forth. Then Marcus wanted to show this man that no, me too, I know something. He started writing, and when he saw how well Marcus could write, he decided to employ him to also write. Whilst he was writing, he also decided to go to school and study law. I am coming back to this man later. Ladies and gentlemen, so Marcus Garvey now was able to catch the attention of this wonderful Dusi Muhammad Ali. And he learned a lot of things from this man. Remember this man because we're going to come back to him very soon. So, he stayed in England for some time and realized that things were not really moving the way he wanted. And then in 1914, he decided to go back to St. Anne in Jamaica, the birthplace of Bob Marley, birthplace of Bernie Spear, and the same birthplace of, of course, the great Marcos Mosaigab. When he arrived, he decided that it was time to start a very strong Pan-Africanist vibe. Because he had gone around England, he had seen how black people were going through trouble, how black people were not united. He picked up a lot of Ethiopianism from Muhammad Ali Duse and returned to Jamaica, 1914. When he returned, ha, ah, nobody could stop Marcus Garvey's fire. He was very angry with the system. And then he met a pretty lady, Amy Ashwood. She had just finished school, and Marcus was interested in marrying the girl. But the parents said, no, hey, you marry who? You are an ugly man, ugly boy. You can't marry this woman. And but the woman loved Marcus. So what happened? They decided to get engaged, but the parents insisted. And the woman said, okay, if my parents are saying no, then let me pull back. Marcus said, if you pull back, I'm committing suicide right now. You are my world. You know when a man loves a woman, likes a woman, he can say anything. You are my world, I love you. You are the apple of my eye. Your eyes glitter like the morning sun. And so on and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, she agreed and then they got married. And true to her words, when they got married, she was able to move Marcus Garvey, who had a hotel room as his office, on Orange Street in St. Anne in Jamaica to a more beautiful building, which became the headquarters, at least in Jamaica. Marcus Garvey said, ah, things are working now. He walked to the governor of Jamaica at that time, Mr. Governor Mannings, and said, Mr. Mannings, please, I need you to help me. And listen to what Marcus Garvey said. I need you to help me with cash. I'm beginning a strong Pan-Africanist movement and my intention is to civilize, listen, civilize the backward people of Africa. 
and two, self-pride as Africa. Listen attentively. I am trying and helping to civilize the backward people of Africa. I am also preaching self-pride. And at the same time, I want a unity for some of these our backward people. He formed the UNIA, United Negro Improvement Association. It was an association that was supposed to improve upon the Negro. Jamaican people said, hey, we know why they were there. Negro, we know a night man. Because Negro is like nigger. It's like an insult. And Marcus said, it is the best word I can use right now for people of African ancestry. He never changed it. Well, that is the beginning and the end of this lecture, ladies and gentlemen. Marcus Garvey started making enemies because of the word Negro. And because Jamaican people felt that he appealed more to the white man, the upper class, because he spoke standard English and he wore a suit and he walked boisterously like that. Ladies and gentlemen, with his wife, they were able to get heavy financial support from the Jamaican governor and the mayor of Kingston, Jamaica, to start with. Hey! The black people in Jamaica will not understand. This man is a pretender. He's a thief. His father was nothing. He himself is nothing. How can he get so much money to be able to do what, what, what? They wrote to the newspapers in Jamaica, controlled by the white press, and they spread it out. This is a thief. This is a liar. And Marcos realized that, hey, Charlie, it was time to run out of Jamaica because the pressure was too much. He ran like a hare all the way to America in 1916. And when he arrived, he had the same UNIA to work it out. They started something very good in America. Finances were coming in. People like C.J. Walker, you know about them in the African history class, and so many other great billionaire Pan-Africanists gave a lot of money to Marcus Garvey. The movement was growing. Boom, 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 boom. 1916, 1917, it was growing. The money was coming in. 1918, ha ah. ha. In 1918, there was a woman at Labadi speaking Ga and eating Ga Kenke, Komi Kenkena. She started hearing the voice of God. Go to America. There's a place called America. And when you arrive, bring all the black people there, the free slaves, bring them back to Ghana. Hey, history does not tell us how she was able to enter America. There is no record of how she entered America, whether it was spiritual, it was physical. The most important thing is that she arrived in America in 1918, and her name was Laura Adokon Kofi. Laura Adokon Kofi. Laura Adokon Kofi. Laura Adokon Kofi. Her other name was Mama Kofi. Ladies and gentlemen, you see this woman? You see the way her photograph is so faded? It's the same way history intended to fade her integrity and her name. When she entered America in 1918, she went straight to Marcus Garvey because she knew that Marcus Garvey was fighting for black people to be repatriated. She went to Marcus Garvey and said, Garvey, I can help you. This woman was a prophetess. She could see you and tell you, hey, this thing would happen in the next two years or in the next one month. Because of that, people saw her as a queen of Africa. Whoa. So people were coming from all different places. She originally arrived in Detroit, Michigan, in America in 1918. At that time, Garvey had already lived in America for two years. She went to Marcus 
And Marcus said, what can you do? He was happy to hear about Ghana. And so on and so forth. She told Marcus a few things that he did in Jamaica. And Marcus stood back and said, wow, you must see Obia woman. He said, yeah, Obia is what? He said, I'm a prophetess. And Marcus decided to put her at the helm of his affairs. And when she took over, millions of people joined the UNIA, all because of this woman and the back to Africa thing. Remember she claimed she had been sent by God from Ghana to come and bring back. And Marcos had the same vision. This was 1918. There was UNIA, but there was no flag. When this woman met Mar Marcos, he said, the f she said, the flag of the UNIA, God has revealed to me, it should be red, to stand for the blood of all our ancestors and the holy blood of Jesus. She was Christian. Marcos himself was Christian. He was Methodist, then he became a Roman Catholic. So you see how that name affected him? The Roman name, Marcos, named after the Roman God, Mars. See? All right. So what happened now? Red is for the blood of the people, Jesus. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the next color was what? Green and black. Black for the people. And then, the one final one is the vegetation of the great people of Africa. She gave the idea to Marcus Garvey. And Garvey was like, wow, that's nice. So UNIA was formed but without a flag until 1920. Two years after the arrival of this beautiful lady, Adoko, Laura Adoko Kofi. And very soon, we are going to be looking at how the flag was used later. Ladies and gentlemen, this woman was able to go around and gather the people all because she was a prophetess and people were so interested in mysticism. She will tell you one or two things, then your mind will go haywire, then you will join the movement of Marcus Garvey. In no time, she became extremely more popular than Marcus Garvey. And Garvey did not like it too much. One, because she was drawing more people towards the church, more than Africa. And Marcus said, no man, but that was not the agreement, madam. We agreed that every person that comes to join the UNIA is making his or her way to Africa. But you bringing them to your church. I can't take that. So, eh, but Africa and the church are one. Garvey said, no, sir. Religion is a personal thing. And the back to Africa thing is a must. The woman said, if that is so, then I got to move. When she left, at that time, they had four million members of the UNIA. That is bigger than Jamaica. If the UNIA members had gone to Jamaica, they would have flooded Jamaica. Four million at that time. And when Laura went out, half of the people followed her. And Marcus said, wow. And each person was paying 25 cents as membership dues every month. Imagine half of the people going and you are not getting the 25 cents every month. He wasn't happy. So history tells us that Marcus decided to hire a killer from Jamaica. And his name was Maxwell Cook. In Jamaica, we call him the bad man. Before Marcus hired the killer, he already announced to the rest of the UNI members, UNIA members, anybody who sees this woman, hurt her. Anybody who sees this woman, get her arrested and charged with fraud. Why fraud? She told me that we are all going back to Africa. Now she's dividing Africa and the church. That was not an agreement, that's fraud. The killer from Jamaica, Maybe he hadn't killed people for a long time, so it was a good job for him. 
He picked up his gun, walked like that all the way to Miami, where Adoko Kofi was preaching in the church. When he entered, he was a trained gunman. Four bullets. Puyaka, 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 puyaka. All bullets went into her head. She did not miss one. And she sank, died. When the members turned and saw that it was Maxwell Cook, they all pounced on him and beat him, killed him and killed his ghost. <laughs> you know when somebody meets, is beating you, he wants to kill you and you die so early. They start beating you even in death so that your ghost will never resurrect. That was how Michael Cook, Maxwell Cook, was killed. The American police could not find any evidence against Marcus. Later, they will look at this in just a, a jiffy. Ladies and gentlemen, Adokokofi was killed in 1928, 10 years exactly after she arrived in America. So the rank of the UNIA was already divided. Adoko side, and she named her church the African Universal Church. UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association. African Universal Church. There was a universal, ladies and gentlemen, when Adoko, Adoko Kofi was gone, Marcus moved on. Now he was focused. They started killing black people, and Marcus said, okay, for any black man that is killed, white people are also going to be killed. Marcus was ready for violence to protect the back to Africa thing. Let us leave Marcus here. Let him rest. Let me take five minutes and go around another great man. He was called Paul Kofi. Paul Kofi, his father was taken as a slave from Africa to America at the age of 10. Paul Kofi. When he arrived in America, his master or his slave owner became a Christian. And reading the Bible, he said, don't own slaves. Let every human being be free. So he freed this man. His name was Kofi. The white man was called Slokum. So his name was Kofi Slokum. He gave birth to the handsome Paul Kofi. Right there. Paul Kofi was born on January 17, 1759. And he was a dangerous black man. You see him handsome and all cool and all nice? Very deadly. He was the first black man to meet an American president at the White House. And it happened in 1812. First black man. At that time, Massachusetts was a colony of Britain. He owned ships. Whilst this man was moving with his ship from the British side to the American side, his ships were seized. And he had to go to the American president at that time, ladies and gentlemen, and plead with him. His ship was called the Traveler, and this was 1812. The first black man, and he was Ghanaian. He succeeded in bringing black people from America. The first man, the first black man who ever brought people from America to Africa was this man. He brought them to Africa 100 solid years before Marcus Garvey started it. This man. And you know what he did? He sponsored every black man who was ready to move. He would not ask you to pay. Come, I'll pay for you. On each ship movement, he spent more than 4,000 American dollars. At that time, that should be like 4 million American dollars today, probably. When they realized that he was succeeding, bringing black people home, he took them to Sierra Leone. At that time, there was a governor there called Sir Charles McCarthy. How many people remember Sir Charles McCarthy? Yes. Sir Charles McCarthy was in Sierra Leone at that time. And he gave money to the white governor 
and said, listen, this money is to bring my people home, build houses for them, and we'll keep them in the houses. Right there inside Sierra Leone, people were coming. On his second shipment, such as McCarthy said, there are too many black people coming to Sierra Leone. They are invading the whole place. Now anybody who is coming to Sierra Leone must swear an allegiance to the crown of America or else don't bring anybody. And the indigents were not ready to swear because they feared that they would be drafted into the army. Ladies and gentlemen, this man spent money and energy to bring Africans home. The first man, Paul Kofi. Ladies and gentlemen, my final segment, and we are done. Remember, Adokokofi was Ghanaian. Her aim was to bring home Ghanaians and the rest of Africa, to Africa, specifically to Ghana. Now this man, Ghanaian, now there was a third Ghanaian, Chief Alfred Sam. He was born in the West Aching area in a small village called Apaso. How many people are from Apaso here? Nobody. How many people know Apaso? Beautiful man. Thank you. Okay. So he was born there, and he was rich. This story is very interesting. Very rich, because he came from the royal family. He went to America, and he was selling coffee, cocoa, and mahogany. When he arrived in America, hey, what is this? He said, all oh, black people, I'm bringing you back to Ghana. Hey. This was before Marcus Garvey's UNIA back to Africa thing. A few years, one or two years before. Ladies and gentlemen, how did he convince the people? He told them lies. Because he wanted all of them to come to Africa. He said, in Africa, when it rains, diamonds fall from the sky. <laughs> so don't rush. When it's raining, just stay at home, or the diamonds can hit your head. When the rain stops, come out with baskets and collect all the diamonds. And the price of one diamond, my brother, imagine carrying the diamonds in a basket. All the African Americans came and stood in queue. They wanted to come to Africa. He said, that is, not enough. that is not all. In Africa, bread grows on trees. Bread. I don't know if it's a sugar bread, or butter bread, or uh, cocoa bread, or wheat bread. But he said, bread grows on trees. And in those days, bread was a political weapon. If you have bread, you have life. He said, what? Diamond and bread, so that is not all. In Africa, sugarcane is as big as stove pipes. Some of us don't know what stove, stove pipes are. Like these, my legs combined, like six of them. Big and fat. He said, we are coming. He said, but you will pay $25 each. He said, yes, we will pay. Marcus Garvey said 25 cents. This man said 25 dollars. They paid. And he bought a ship. The ship, ladies and gentlemen, he changed the name from the Kutiba, it was a German ship. He changed it to SS Liberia. Marcus Garvey did the same thing. He changed it from SS Yarmouth. Yarmouth is a Canadian something. He changed it to what? An African name. You see how they were thinking, alike. And he brought the people, all of them in the ship. And when they arrived in Sierra Leone, British people stopped them. Hey, where are you going? Who is the owner of this ship? Say, I, I am the owner, sir. Black man, you own a ship? They stayed there for three solid months so that they would check all the papers and everything to be sure that a black man was able to own a ship. And it came out that, yes, he owned that ship. Ladies and gentlemen, so they continued. All the way from Sierra Leone, went through the Gambia. At that time, the capital of the Gambia was called Bartest. 
all the way, they arrived in salt form. When they arrived, hey, there was so much fanfare. Masqueraders came out to dance, to dance, because they believed that these people were bringing them bread. <laughs> but the people were coming for the bread that was growing on the trees. <laughs> Unfortunately, the day they arrived in salt form, it rained heavily. So they all ran into their hideouts and looking once in a while to see if things were dropping. When the rain, it rained for three solid days. So the diamond should have hit like this. When they came out, oh. Sir, where is the diamond? He said, go to the seaside. The water washed it towards the sea. They all ran to the sea. They came back, there was no diamond. Ah, was the sea rough? He said, yes, the sea was very rough. Then probably it washed it into the sea, but it will wash it back. And the people believed you for a certain reason. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Alfred, that's him. Very, very handsome gentleman. And his aim was to bring them to Africa. He succeeded in bringing them to Africa, salt pond. Oh, the malaria started eating them up. He said, oh, you said we'll get sugar cane. He said we'll get bread and a diamond. We don't even need this, but we need our health. We are dying. They died like mosquitoes. And then the indigenous also came out because they did not see bread. They are coming to steal our land. They are thieves. They are pirates. And they started becoming very, very aggressive towards the people. Some returned. Some stayed. Some went back to Liberia and Sierra Leone. And Chief was so downhearted, he went to Liberia and nobody heard about him. So history says that he died probably in the 1930s, before Marcos Garvey died in 1940. So, in a nutshell, you see how Ghanaians worked very hard to start it before Marcos Garvey. Why does history not talk too much about these people but Marcos Garvey? Marcos Garvey was organized. Marcos Garvey was ready to use violence to succeed. Marcos Garvey had support from the Jamaican government. That was colonial. He even had support from America initially. And then black people came up again. Oh, he's using the money. He's dressing so flamboyantly. He sits in a Cadillac and they drive him around. Cadillac. And he's just talking. Ladies and gentlemen, he tried to get the ship. He got the ship. He went through problems. They took him to court. They jailed him. He went through a whole lot of trouble. If we meet to talk about them, that will take us three more days. He divorced his first wife, came for another wife who was very instrumental in the UNIA movement. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Garvey never succeeded in bringing one person home to stay. But he sent very experienced people, a team, two times, to go all the way to Africa to survey the place. Engineers, doctors, nurses, to build up Africa. But the governor at that time did not allow it. So Laura Adokokofi went to Marcus Garvey and said, Marcus, you know what? Forget about Liberia. Let's take them to Ghana. And he named the ship the Black Star Liner. After an original ship which was called the White Star Liner. Listen to the words. White Star Liner, White Star Line. He said, Black Star Liner. SS Yama. He says, no. We don't want that. We want an African name for it. Marcos became extremely popular. Hey! White people were ready for him. They found out that he studied under Duse Muhammad Ali. You remember? 
So they wrote a long letter to Duse Muhammad Ali. Charlie, tell us the character of this Marcos Garvey. Because they were trying to find a way to crucify him. He's a thief, he's this, he's that. But they couldn't find anything. Even the attorney general in America at that time, Edgar Hoover, said, this man, we want to jail him, but we have nothing against him. He has not flouted any of the rules. And do say Muhammad Ali, this man, the man who mentored Marcus Garvey, ladies and gentlemen, wrote a long letter. He said, this man is a thief. -o. This man called Marcus Garvey, he's a thief. Hey, when he was with me, he's smart. But he is a social climber. He uses people to climb. He so broke to the bottom. He was my messenger. He went back to Jamaica selling tombstones, gravestones, and cats. Now he's rich because he's used the people and he's very eloquent. And when they got that against Marcus Garvey, it was the strong point to deal with him. His own people stood on some of these things, talked against him. Oh, there was no transparency. There was no this. The money was being spent. And then the investigation started. They went into the Black Star Liner. They checked a few things out. The accounts and everything. They found nothing wrong. But they said, the man was using the mail to defraud people. A man who publicly said, when you see Laura Kofi, hurt her. Who do you remember saying that in Ghana? Who threatened that when they see somebody, they should kill the person or beat the person up? Yeah. Same thing Marcus Garvey said. When you see that Laura Kofi, hurt her. When you see her, make sure that you charge her with fraud. And Laura was killed. He was never touched. But when he was doing his things to unite black people, they were able to hold him because of male fraud. That was how Marcus Garvey was sent back to Jamaica. In five minutes, it will be done. When he arrived in Jamaica, the opposition was still on. Serious opposition. What was the opposition? Du Bois. Everybody knows Du Bois in Ghana. He came to Ghana and died in Ghana. Du Bois, W-E-B Du Bois. He called Marcus Garvey ugly. He called him a cheat and a thief. And Marcus Garvey also said he was a white nigger because he looked more white than black. They started fighting each other. Then there was another one, George Padmore. You all know George pa Padmore, don't you? George Padmore also put so much pressure on Marcus Garvey. He ran back from Jamaica because Jamaica was very hostile towards him. When he returned to England, because he couldn't go to America, he arrived in England. He was in England, and remember, if your boss, the UNIA boss, is deported to Jamaica, a land he was running from because of extreme hostility towards his UNIA movement, now he's returning there. He ran out of it again and went to England. There he suffered a mild stroke. And George Padmore, who is a strong Pan-Africanist, wrote in a column in the newspaper, oh, Marcus Garvey is dead. May he rest in peace, blah, 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 blah. And somebody mistakenly took the newspaper to Marcus Garvey. He opened it and he saw an obituary. Marcus Mosiah Garvey Jr. from 1887 to 1940. Rest in peace with his picture. He suffered another stroke immediately and died. <laughs> and he died with the UNIA. When he died, the dream to bring black people back to Africa died with him. Why did he die with him? Even Nkrumah, who was inspired so much by this man, came, we vilified him and buried him like a rat. Hey, when they met in 1963, 
in Addis Ababa, at the highest last to build the organization of African unity, what happened? They were divided into two. Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Algeria, those on one side, the other on one side. Oh, we believe that independence should be now. Africa should unite now. The rest of the 25 said, oh, let's take it slow, you know. They were divided even in African unity. But Marcos was a dreadful figure. He said, now, and when they have cast, those we call have cast their mixed blood, they were trying to drag their feet, say, you guys are all niggers. Get out of here. You are not even part of us. If you read the opinions, the philosophy and opinions of Marcos Garvey, he said, you and I members must be what? Full-blooded African. The mulattoes, the octotrums, the megatrums, and all those people were not supposed to be part of it. And they hated him. All the Pan-Africanists at that time, including John Padmore, W.E.B. Du Bois, they preached a separatist movement or separatist rhetoric. What is that? Oh, black people and white people should unite. Marcos Gavi said, we can unite, oh. Black people one side, white people one side. Let all Africans and black people come to one side. We are going to Africa. And let white people stay away. That's what he preached. The others preached what? Segregationist rhetorics. But he came with what is known as separatist. Let's separate ourselves. In 1930, the nation of Islam picked the same thing. They were inspired by Marcos Garvey. And the nation of Islam, under Mohammed Farad, now is Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan. They say black people at one side, white people on one side. That was what Marcos Garvey preached. And that was the decider. What made white people hate him? His own black people hate him, but at the beginning, you remember he went to white people to get funds and all that? And now when all these things happen, he said, well, I have what I want now. Black people one side. These people are not ready to support us. The Jamaican governor was so happy to hear that Africans are backward and uncivilized. And Marcos Gavi told that to him, yes, we are backward, we are uncivilized. I want to go and civilize them. Can you give me money? Say, ha, 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 ha. take the money. When he got the money, he said, ah, okay. Diplomacy, right? That's why Muta Baruka says, when you read the philosophies and opinions of Marcos Garvey, you will see how Marcos Garvey was politicking carefully in his own words. He even met with a Ku Klux Klan to tell them, hey, Ku Klux Klan, what you are doing is right. Keep your white people on one side. We too will keep our black people on one side. See? Ladies and gentlemen, coming home today, Nana Ado wants black people to come home. Come home and invest. It's the same Marcos Garvey thing. But are they coming to see the bread on top of the African trees? Are they going to see the diamond that is going to fall from the sky? Or they are going to get a sugar cane that is as big as stove, stove pipes? No. You got to be organized. It took Marcos Garvey years to organize and centralize. His own people around him cut his legs in the Ghanaian palace and brought him down. To be able to make this back to Africa thing happen, patriotism is one, sacrifice is two, diplomacy three. Four square meals or triangular meals a day and unite Africa, no sir, it won't happen. You should be ready to go hungry for days in order to see a certain something happen. You want Africans to come home. Have you told those at home that those coming are not going to bring bread? Have you told them? Because when we hear people are coming from America, from England, we are waiting for the bread. Right? Chief Alfred Sam. So when they come without the bread, even if 
they give you the bread once, twice, they get funny. See? In order for these things to happen, patriotism, pan Africanism, we need to know where we are going. We need to hold it very firm. Devoid of the small, small politics. Laura had a coffee. Oh, church. Back to Africa, divided into two. NDC, NPP. Oh, we started it. They continue. It now will happen. One front. Or else you're wasting your time. Have you dealt with the corruption in the country? Now these people are tired of corruption up there. They are tired. They want to come home to see worse corruption here. Would it work? They are looking for a garden of Eden. The one that has the sugar cane growing as fat as the stove pipes. They want to enter the garden of Eden and see bread growing on trees. They want to see the diamond that is falling from every rain. It's a parable. That is why a lot of people, when I see people come from wherever and live here, I respect them. When I go to Amsterdam, Holland, I can drive all the way from Amsterdam to France, going through Germany, Belgium, and all those countries. There's not a single border. Let me make a mistake in France. I come home, and there's a receipt waiting for me to go and pay for breaking the traffic rule. But don't go here. Look at the borders. And these people behave like animals. When you're coming to Ghana, they also behave like bigger animals. Beating, you're not a Ghanaian, you're not a this. Who called you Ghanaian? They want the United Front. See how big America is. They call themselves Americans. And you come here, every tiny dot has a name. So if Nana Ato wants to succeed, if Ghana wants to succeed, I'm not surprised Nana Ato is doing this. Because you see all those Ghanaians, Slap that UNIA flag there. It looks exactly like this. I said I was going to get back to that. When Laura Adokokofi died, they buried her with the UNIA flag. This. They wrapped her whole body with the flag that she helped to create for the UNIA. And this was the flag that inspired the Ghana flag. Marcus Garvey. Look, Marcus Garvey would have been living with us today if we did not betray him. If we did not give the white man the chance to nail him. Ladies and gentlemen, Nana Akufu Adu is a great personality. He's following in the footsteps of Laura Adokwe Adu, Ad Adoko Kofi, Paul Kofi, and Alfred Chifsan. And what is Nana Ado promising the people? That what? That they'll give them land? That they'll give them what? We are here, we don't even have land. Free visa. Oh, when they came from America, they came here on a free visa, on the ships. So that is not a new thing. Let us sit back, put a plan in place and lure the people positively, unlike Chief Charles. That way, we'll be able to have a united Africa. Let the dream of Marcus Garvey not die. Let the dream of Laura Adokokofi not die. Let the dream of Paul Kofi not die. Let the dream of all these wonderful people heralded by the great Marcus Garvey. Let that dream succeed. Thank you very much.